Many Intel CPU architectures have come and gone over the years, but few are as infamous as NetBurst. Launched in 2000 to replace the P6 architecture of the Pentium 3 with the NetBurst Pentium 4, NetBurst lasted for four generations until 2006 with the release of his special $1000 processor, the Ultimate NetBurst. And it was this, the Pentium D Extreme 965. Today we're going to have a look at what this chip is, how Intel got there, and we're going to put it through its paces. So let's get started. Now the idea behind NetBurst was quite simple. We continue to push clock speeds even further. And Intel did this by deepening the pipeline from 10 stages to 20 stages. Now what this does is this reduces the amount of work a CPU has to do in each step of the pipeline, which allows it to run faster. But it also gets less work done in each step of the pipeline. And for the first two generations, Willamette and Northwood, this worked out reasonably well. Especially the second generation Northwood was quite well regarded. It got a die shrink to 130 nanometer, it got extra cache and also hyper threading. But then we reached the Intel Developers Forum 2003, where Intel presented Prescott, which took the NetBurst architecture to new pipeline depths, as they lengthened the pipeline to now 31 stages and quoted it could reach 4 to 5 gigahertz. In practice, however, Prescott was quite literally a hot mess, only managing to outpace Northwood by sheer clock speed advantage. But in many cases, Northwood was actually faster. Around this time in 2004, AMD was on its way creating their dual-core Athlon X2 processors. And Intel didn't want to miss out on the dual-core boat, but they didn't have a ground-up design ready to go. So instead what they did is fuse two Prescott Pentium 4 dies together to create the Pentium D. And by only days did they manage to beat AMD to having the first consumer dual-core CPU. And the Pentium D was an interesting move, as on the whole it was slower than AMD's Athlon X2. But as they were able to reuse a lot from the Intel Pentium 4 Prescott, using the same die, same architecture, it meant the chips were a lot cheaper. So in practice they were actually quite decent buys. To keep NetBurst relevant a little longer, Intel introduced Cedar Mill in 2005. Now architecturally nothing changed, but to ease the power consumption pains, it got Intel's new 65 nanometer process node and also more cache. Which brings us to March 22nd, 2006, when Intel launched this, the Pentium D Extreme 965, the ultimate netburst, with two cores, with hyperthreading enabled at a whopping 3.73 GHz, a 1066 MB transfer front side bus, a whopping 4 MB of L2 cache, and this of course all fully unlocked. And the bizarre thing is that only weeks earlier, at the Intel Developers Forum, Intel showed off Conroe, the next generation of CPUs, which showed amazing performance, but also basically rendered the 965 obsolete before it was even launched. And the thing I want to mention with NetBurst is that when people think of NetBurst, they probably think of mid-level Pentium 4s, which were very common in office and school environments. But Compared to that, this one is an absolute monster with twice the cores and four times the cache. But does that mean it's any good now? Well, let's find out. To give this special chip its best possible shot, here we're running an ASUS P5V Pro motherboard. Now that has the advantage of having the X48 chipset, which brings not only PCIe 2.0, but most notably DDR3 memory. In this case, we're running 16 gigabyte of Corsair Vengeance DDR3 1600. Now it won't be running at that speed, but hopefully having 16 gigabytes will help in modern applications. For other components, we also have a SATA Mugen cooler, a SATA 3 SSD, we've got a GTX 1060, and a Corsair RM 1000X power supply. So let's put it all together.
And there it is. Let's get into the BIOS. Pentium D Extreme with 16 gigs of DDR3. So here we are running the Pentium D Extreme in Windows 10, and it's actually running quite nicely. The first thing that's quite interesting is that in both the task manager as in CPU Z is being recognized as an engineering sample CPU, which it isn't, but it could very well be that the uh, stepping and revision were both the same for the engineering sample as for the consumer CPUs. Another thing of interest if we pull up the other CPU Z readouts is we are running with 16 gig of DDR3 at 1066 megatransfers per second. However, we didn't get an Pentium D Extreme Edition just to run it at stock clock speeds. So it's time to turn it up a bit. And after many hours of tweaking, we're back in Windows. Now the frequency is up from 3.73 gigahertz, now up to a whopping 4.6 gigahertz, nearly a gigahertz faster. So we really now have the ultimate net burst in its ultimate form. But what does that equate to in terms of performance? Well, I'm going to compare it to some CPUs I've tested in the past, but I've also benchmarked this, the Core 2 Quad Extreme QX6700. This is the quad-core Conroe-based chip, which replaced the Pentium D Extreme as Intel's best CPU. Let's find out, starting with Cinebench R15. In Cinebench R15 it scored 115 points, which is less than half of the Core 2 Quad. Overclocking raised performance 23%, at which point it was nearly as fast as the Penrin Core 2 Duo. However, comparing it to Alder Lake, single thread performance, even when overclocked, was only one-fifth of the 12600K. Moving to 7-zip, the 965 Extreme performed slightly better beating the Penrin Core 2 Duo, and when overclocked for both compression and decompression. The QX6700 was still twice as fast though. And finally in Geekbench 5 we saw the best performance. When overclocked the Pentium D Extreme was 43% behind the Conroe Core 2 Quad Extreme in multi-thread, but only 14% behind in single thread, which is quite a decent performance. So in synthetic tests it's not very fast, even when overclocked by nearly a gigahertz compared to modern CPUs, but that probably wasn't that surprising. What I did find surprising is just how snappy and reasonably nice it is to use for just daily tasks, doing some browsing, a bit of office work. It's really quite snappy. It's probably helped by the 16 gigas of DDR3. I was even able to edit some 1080p video in DaVinci Resolve. Now, as we saw in the synthetic tests, rendering won't be fast. But it was able to smoothly run DaVinci Resolve in a way which you could edit some video on it. What was also surprising is that YouTube playback, really good on it, probably held by the 1060, but was able to play 1080p 60fps YouTube without any drop frames at all. Totally smooth. Even when upping it to 1440p 60, it did have some dropped frames here and there, but Overall, it was still a watchable experience. It was really only when we got up to 4K 60fps when things started to fall apart, when it really became too choppy. But overall, I'd say most people just wouldn't be able to tell that they're running on an 18-year-old CPU. So that is quite impressive. Now let's get to gaming, and we'll start off with a big one, because here we're running Battlefield 5 64-player multiplayer on the Pentium D. And as you can see, it's not running very fast, we're running at around 10 to 12 FPS or so, but we're running it on a Pentium D, a CPU from 2006, and Battlefield 5 64 player is notoriously CPU heavy, so the fact it is running it at all is really rather impressive, and it's running it pretty consistently, 10 to 12 FPS or so, it's not really dipping below that, but not much better than that either, but it's running it 
pretty reliably. I've played a bit of it so far. And as you can see, the CPU is absolutely maxed out. We are using more than 8 gigs of RAM, so we're really making good use of that extra memory. But overall, I'm really impressed with this running as well as it is. And other games run quite quite a lot better than this, so let's have a look at those as well. Starting with GTA 5 at 1080p with the high preset, and overclocked to 4.6 GHz, it ran around 20 to 25 FPS, and reasonably consistent. However, as is the problem with all slower CPUs in GTA 5, once you do start to drive faster, it struggles to load in textures and assets, making the game world increasingly more glitchy as you go along. However, I'd still say that this is some good effort given it is a dual-core netburst chip. Next up is Rise of the Tomb Raider, running in DirectX 11 at 1080p with the lowest settings. It had its work cut out here as it struggled to maintain 20 FPS, even when overclocked. At stock it averaged 19 FPS, rising 21% to 23 FPS average when overclocked. And even then the stock Core 2 Quad QX6700 was still 65% faster. And finally, for the most impressive result, we have Doom 2016 using the Vulkan API at 1080p with high settings. And here the overclocked 965 maintained over 40 FPS with smooth frame times and good consistency. You could easily play Doom using this machine, which really is quite impressive. So far we've looked at overclocking results, but what about power draw? one of NetBurst's most infamous aspects. Well, at its stock 3.73 GHz, the 965 runs at a V-core of 1.33 volts, which in Cinebench results in a power draw of around 93 watts, which isn't that bad, considering it has a TDP rating of 130 watts. Now, overclocking to 4.6 GHz requires around 1.51 volts, which really skyrockets power draw now to over 160 watts. But then I thought, what about if we go down in power instead? So, still at the 3.73 GHz, I was able to lower the V-Core now to only 1.18 volt, which really turned this Extreme Edition CPU into a very frugal chip. In Cinebench R15, now only 63 watts of average power draw, which is really quite frugal, and here we see the effect of Intel's excellent 65 nanometer process. So there we have it, a fresh look at the very best chip of Intel's worst architecture. Although that is of course excluding their abandoned Prescott successor, the 7 GHz 50 stage pipeline Tejas and Jayhawk project, prototypes of which I showed in a previous video. Make sure to check that one out if you haven't already. But for the fastest netburst chip that did reach consumers, the Pentium D Extreme 965, I did better than I had expected. Sure, the Conroe successor was still much, much faster, but considering this chip is 16 years old now, but no, even 18 years old now, it did quite well. YouTube playback was great, you could do some browsing, even play games, it ran Battlefield 5, albeit poorly, but still. But overall I'd say the performance was quite decent indeed. And this was a lot of fun to test, it really took a lot of time to get the overclock dialed in and really see what you can extract out of NetBurst in optimal scenario with a modern, more modern platform, DDR3 memory and a nice overclock. And I hope you have enjoyed it as well, and if you did a like would be very much appreciated. And why not subscribe to the fully buffered channel if you've enjoyed this video. Well, in any case, that was all for now and bye bye.